My name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Siobhan Ball. We're on Linfield College campus in McMinnville. Excuse me. We're on the Linfield University campus in McMinnville. University. It's July 9th, 2020. Uh, and thank you so much, Siobhan, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, first question, most important question to start with is why wine? Why wine? It's a great question. Wine makes everything better. <laughs> Breakfast, lunch, dinner, parties, celebrations baths, cleaning your house. Yeah, <laughs> it comes from the earth and then it makes your life better. It's pretty great. <laughs> Brings people together. Yeah. What point did you become interested in joining the, the wine industry, becoming doing wine for a living, I guess? I think it was a really slow process for me. It wasn't intentional. I was working in restaurants and then I started enjoying the story of wine and how wine enhanced people's experience during their dining experience. And then um, I never thought I would really fully focus on wine. I thought I just would keep sort of working in restaurants, but moving to France changed that. Um, I still was trying to figure out what to do with wine or what to do in wine. And I think I'm still sort of playing with different ideas, but uh, I still like to think I'm a little bit of everything, not just wine. Tell me about the process of learning wine, first from the, the restaurant background and then the more formalized education. What was it about the product that appealed to you in the start and then what did you kind of learn as you, as you learned more? Going from learning the difference between like a Pinot Gris and a Chardonnay <laughs> was a pretty big jump at the time. I worked on a cruise ship where we served blush wine. <laughs> I thought that was a thing, right? <laughs> um, and I didn't grow up with wine. But then my first fine dining restaurant they gave a really great basic lesson on the different varietals, the different places. And then moving to working at Le Pigeon was where I started to learn about the history of wine in a deeper way, thinking, learning about monks and these tiny villages and just the generations that these wines have been through. And I thought, wow, it's such an interesting story to do all of that work and put it in a bottle and ship it across and then it's on this table and just that whole sort of process and then again moving to France was a big kind of turning point. So tell us about that, tell me about, well before we get to that let's talk about Le Pigeon a little bit. I'm, I'm sort of curious about your experiences there, the Portland fine dining scene. Yeah, so I started working at Le Pigeon just after they opened, so in the summer of 2006. At that time they were still doing brunch, so we were doing brunch service. And at first it was a pretty just ragtag group of people just really being quite professional every night but just throwing a really fun party and making really good food and serving really great wine. And then it was when Andrew Fortgang came on um, as our general manager and eventually owner. Um, started really sort of guiding the wine experience and that's when I started learning about these sort of nuances between Burgundy and uh, Beaujolais specifically and all the French wines and really learning about these differences and how they, why they're different um, and that's when I really started to get into the, the meat of like why I liked wine and just that sort of thing because it tied all these things together that I loved. Tell me about the customers at that time and, and their kind of interest and knowledge level with, with fine wine fun. They were fine and uh, they had money to spend and they wanted to spend it and they wanted to have a good time and uh, they were open to new ideas and different choices and you started to learn sort of how to guide that experience because you were sometimes giving them things they didn't know they wanted which I thought was really fun and um, being able to talk them through it and then being able to talk them through it to the point of knowing the story of the family and bringing that also to the table was really fun. People were really getting into um, Oregon wine at the time too. And that was really fun to be able to have that connection with Oregon winemakers coming into Le Pigeon or having dinners, dinner events with them and being able to have that, that even deeper connection. Mm -hmm. You mentioned obviously already uh, moving to France is a big turning point for you. So tell us how it came about uh, and, and what you were doing once you got to France. So I had been studying French uh, for two years just while I was working at Le Pigeon. I was working on a degree and I needed a language credit. <clears throat> so I figured I'm working at this French restaurant. I'll take French. Sure. <laughs> 
so I took French. <laughs> and um, in 2008, um, I just had a, a bad breakup, you know, sometimes people get on the internet and buy a lot of clothes or um, things they don't need. Um, I laid on my couch for two months and then I woke up one day and I just said, I'm moving to France. <laughs> and <laughs> I did, <laughs> six months later. Um, I went to study at the University Catholique in Lyon 2 and it was one of those things I just applied to the university. I thought. I probably won't get in, then I got in, and then I was like, oh, I probably won't get the visa, went to San Francisco, got the visa, okay, so now I got the visa, so I guess I'm moving to France. So I decided in February of 2009, and I was living in France by, 2000 and, by August of 2009. And what was your initial, kind of initial impression, what was your initial experience? Well, I got off the plane and I thought, I totally speak French, this is going to be great, I got this, I've got these giant bags, no problem. And then I walked through the airport and I realized I did not speak French. <laughs> um, so it was three months of pure exhaustion and days where I was like, do I have to leave the house? Because if I leave the house I have to speak French, maybe I just don't have to leave the house today. Um, but I was really lucky. I became friends with the right people in those first three months and that was really helpful to learn the language. Mm -hmm. And one of the big pieces was when I was working at Le Pigeon, Gabe was dating a woman named Hannah, who's now his wife and they have three children. Mm -hmm. Hannah's friend Kelly Sandoval was also moving to France and Gabe kept telling me there's this woman who's moving to France, you should meet her. And Hannah kept telling Kelly there's this woman who's moving to France, you should meet her. And separately, we both were like, okay, big deal, this girl's moving to France, like, we're not going to live near each other, France is a big country. Well, it turns out she was moving there to be with her then-boyfriend, who is Aurelien Firaday, who's the export manager for Terroir Original, which is an export company for Beaujolais. <laughs> so they lived 30 minutes outside of Lyon. And so we got to talking, and three weeks after I arrived in France, I went to visit her for the day. I had never met her in Portland, even though we both had lived in Portland and had mutual friends. I took the train for the day and thought I would come home that afternoon. Four days later, <laughs> I came home. <laughs> um, finally needed to like really get, get back to my house. But I had the opportunity to meet winemakers whose wine I had just been pouring at Le Pigeon. Winemakers that I thought were gonna be these, you know, ascot wearing, pipe smoking <laughs> French winemakers. Mm -hmm. And then I met them and they were really humble farmers who just wanted to put a really great product into the bottle. And that was the first sort of wine experience. Long dinners and castles and, you know, ridiculousness of it all. <laughs> the dreamy. I remember sitting at Domaine Fellow and, you know, overlooking this beautiful forested areas and these hills. And there was a castle on the other side, and I said, oh, that's such a beautiful castle. And the wife said, oh, that's my friend's house. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> so that was like a very dreamy experience, but that's sort of the French life in some ways. So tell me about, uh, as you were in France longer studying and learning wine, mm -hmm. tell me about sort of... At what point did you start to kind of think about what you would do next? At what point did you kind of decide, figure out how you would get into the world of wine, or was that still kind of in the future for you, definitely? Still kind of in the future. When I went there, I had no real plan as far as what job I will do after this. Um, I lived in Lyon for the most part, and then I moved to a small village outside of Geneva, um, but in France, where I to help tend a vineyard for the summer. That was fantastic. And then the visa came up and I had to come back. And when I came back, Little Bird was opening. And so it made sense. And they offered me the management position. And so that, made, that seemed to make the most logical sense, right? I've been a server for three years. Now I've lived in France. Let's go ahead and move to managing this big restaurant. It took me 10 years to realize I don't really like managing restaurants. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> so when I came back, I started managing and I thought that's what I was going to do. And, you know, helping with wine buying. And then I moved to different restaurants and continued that process and still always trying to find that 
that niche, but the being the middle between not a server and not the owner is a tough place to be sometimes. Hmm. So along the way, you got your sommelier certification and it kind of became more of a wine scholar, I guess would be the right word for it. So tell me about sort of uh, learning wine and, and learning the, the wine buying aspect of things from the restaurant side and, and how to build a wine list and, and those kinds of things. Yeah, everything's, you know, wine is um, fashionable. Things come in and out of fashion. <laughs> um, I remember when no one was making rosé. Now everyone's making a rosé. Um, same with sparkling in Oregon. So there's just always, there's, you know, following the trends, if you will. And then, um, you know, pairing your wine with your food and the the, co the price points and you know how much space you have. There's a lot of other factors that go in. How deep your pockets are, because <laughs> you're sitting on product, you know, and you got to be able to move it. Mm -hmm. um, and that was always tricky because I've worked at a few restaurants and everyone had a different sort of thing. Park Kitchen only had French, Oregon, Spanish wines, um, and Washington, I guess, as well, uh, but no Italian. So that limits limits things, but it also kind of gives you a focus, so that's mm -hmm. really cool too. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was a real, each place was different. It just really depended on which place I was working at and what year it was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so tell me, before you started your current business, Dirty Radish, mm -hmm. um, what other kind of ex experiences did you have uh, in terms of like event planning, in terms of consulting? At what point did those kind of things become part of what you're working with? Yeah, I saw an opportunity after I had been managing a few restaurants and, um, you know, was kind of tired of the late hours and the culture of, you know, you get off at midnight, 1 a.m. and the only thing that's open is a bar and um, that culture and my body still is adjusting to not working till midnight every night. Um, and so I saw opportunities to consult and help with a wine list from afar and I really enjoyed that because I like teaching about wine and more importantly, the selling of wine table side, um, getting people excited about telling the winemaker's story um, because that really adds to the selling point. And then events, I just love throwing a party. Like I love throwing really good parties. <laughs> and so when people gave me opportunities to do that, I thought, well, this is fun. So I kept doing that and it started probably with um, some smaller things and then I did you know I volunteered with Feast the first year which was a pretty fun deal um, and then I started working I started starting to transition out of working um, in <clears throat> well I guess I should say at first I thought I wanted to do events because I did Kelly and Aurelian's wedding and it was featured in Oregon Bride and Groom magazine and I thought well this is it I'm <laughs> going to do events but then I had to constantly tell brides and grooms that their budget wasn't enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, because they're like, we want this and this and this and this. And you have to say, so that's $17 a person. Mm -hmm. That doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. And that was just hard. You know, everyone wants to DIY. You got cousin so-and-so doing this. <laughs> so I realized that that wasn't necessarily what I wanted to do. But then I started working for people like Tournant and the Nightwood Society. And I loved helping events that are a little more, they've already done that part. I just mm -hmm. get to come in and do the fun stuff of mm -hmm. running the event. So clearly you had a hospitality bent to everything you were doing or to things you were enjoying doing. So tell me how you sort of developed a hospitality philosophy and, and what it was you were, whether it was an event, whether it was selling wine table side, whether it was, uh, you know, any, any, anything like that, consulting, what it was you're trying to bring to the hospitality side of things. So growing up, I grew up in a multicultural house and um, <clears throat> dinner was always some type of strange conjoined of these cultures. <laughs> my grandmother was from Germany, my family on my dad's side is Southern and so meals were a combination of German and Southern. But because we're such a small family, my grandmother would make it a point to really make a little bit of something for everybody and that was the first sort of hospitality if you will and taking being taken care of and I think that's what everybody wants when they go to a restaurant especially for an experience and so if I can give a person whether it's at an event or in a tasting or at a dinner 
a moment where they're not having to worry about anything, where they're being taken care of. I've done my job. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And that translates in everything that I do. But when it comes to wine, it's sort of natural. It's already right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Specifically when it comes to like table side, like some work in, in, on, a, on a restaurant floor, what, how, what did you find were the most successful ways to get people excited about wine, especially something they maybe didn't know about or a, per, a, a place they'd never heard of or a varietal they weren't familiar with? Uh, really talking about the story of the wine, telling them how it's made, what's the soil, why they chose those grapes, why they chose that place, um, in a really succinct and, and sort of basic way. But I think there's a lot of a disconnect from the consumer and the maker and the maker and the consumer. Um, you know, I remember taking people on wine tours and they would, during, during you know, harvest time, and I would say, oh, you know, you can taste the grapes. And they would say, are you, sh are you sure? Like, it's not going to mess it up? And I'm like, no, they lose a lot of grapes during harvest. You can have a few, it, it'll be fine, it doesn't mess it up. So they don't, they don't even mm -hmm. know sort of the sort of like, what we would say is in wine, you know, a basic thing, but that's that disconnect. And so really getting people to understand, and then that gives them, a, um, you know, the power to, to make their own decision and to really think about things. Mm -hmm. And it gets them excited about making their choice. And then they want to meet that maker, right? And that's that whole thing again, of connecting those consumers and makers. And so that's what I was always trying to do mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm not like white wine has to go with fish and if it's a steak, it has to be a, something heavy and big. Like I, I believe champagne first of all goes with everything. Think of something, there's nothing that it doesn't go with. <laughs> There's nothing. No, nothing. There's nothing. There's literally nothing. <laughs> literally nothing. <laughs> and so, why not? And you have to like sometimes kind of get people into that even idea of that. And so, kind of opening their, their mind away from what maybe is old traditions, if you will. Mm -hmm. So, you, you spent a while as, as a manager before you decided that wasn't really what you wanted to do. So, what's your, what's your next step as you decide to do the next thing? So, with Dirty Radish, you know, I... Um, initially thought of it as a travel company and uh, wanted to do tours in France for sure. I worked for another company this year working in the Lamp Valley and I'm still trying to find my niche in Lamp Valley because I'm not the typical driver, there's a lot more education, a lot more curation, not to say that the drivers don't do that but there's definitely that sort of um, offering right now mm -hmm. and I want to offer what I like and what I want to do something <laughs> different. France is a completely different experience and um, now with COVID I've had to pivot and so I'm leaning much more heavy on my consulting side and hopefully soon education and being able to do more even if they're virtual speaking engagements. I had a lot of stuff lined up yeah. <laughs> just before COVID. <laughs> Some things I was really excited about. In fact an event that was supposed to happen here at Linfield um, in May which we'll still do as soon as we're able. I'm very excited. Um, but yeah, I've had to just pivot just like everybody else into mm -hmm. different things. And so thankfully the work to do um, consulting is there. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm feeling really good about that. Um, what's next? Mm -hmm. Day by day, moment mm -hmm. by moment. <laughs> I, can't, I can't predict where I'll be two days from now. <laughs> As you were conceiving of Dirty Radish, for, first of all, why did you call it Dirty Radish? Mm. And, and second of all, what were you, what was, what were you hoping to achieve with it? What was the, what was the kind of the the, the core of, of the business idea? <laughs> so, <laughs> the core idea of Dirty Radish, for sure, was that I wanted to spend more time in France, <laughs> and also to that end, hearing people kind of talk about their experience in traveling to France and how it was sort of rushed or um, they thought people were snotty or they didn't get the same experiences that I would tell them that I had had. <clears throat> and so I thought, we're not really experiencing France or the culture or these places or the food. And so what, what could I do? And so the two sort of things sort of came together. I started calling it Dirty Radish because the I had a dinner party um, with a giant whiteboard and a bunch of friends to talk about starting this travel company and what that would look like and what do I need to do and I was in the kitchen cooking and there was some food out and things 
and someone came into the kitchen to grab these radishes and I said don't touch that it's a dirty radish and someone from the other room said write that on the board <laughs> and so we wrote dirty radish on the board and over the course of the evening <laughs> it kept getting circled <laughs> so the next morning I looked at it and I just I don't know I sat with it and I really liked it and it reminded me of this time when I was in Paris and I saw um, at a market, a big stack of radishes, and it was so beautiful, but if you looked really closely, they were still dirty, mm -hmm. because they'll give them a quick rinse, but you need to take them home and tend to your your food. That's sort of part of the culture of France and the, the market way, and I kind of always liked that. So it just sort of worked, and you don't really know like what it means. It's got a little... A little mystery. A little mystery. <laughs> So as you were as you were listening to the, the complaints people had had about or their, their their thoughts on traveling to France versus your experiences there, how did you sort of start crafting what a tour would look like compared to what they'd had in the past? What were you trying to emphasize on on a tour through the Dirty Radish? So for sure, when we go anywhere, um, whether it's in Lamont Valley or um, in France in Beaujolais, uh, when we walk into places, I'm friends with the people. I don't take people to places that are just on the list of places to go, I genuinely have relationships or connections with the people, whether it's a chef or a winemaker. Um, one of my favorite things that we do um, on my trips to Beaujolais, or to Lyon and Beaujolais is uh, we play petanque with a bunch of older people in a square who they genuinely just go to the square every day and play petanque. And if you know anything about petanque, it's a very serious game. They take it very seriously. So they don't really let people who don't know how to play play because they don't want to mess up their scores. <laughs> but I'm friends with these people. So when we walk up with my group of usually eight people, they'd say, hi, Siobhan, we're so good to see you. And then we end up playing petanque with them. And it's like such a charming and real moment because I enjoy playing petanque, which is like bocce ball, um, but better. <laughs> uh, and drinking pastis or drinking, you know, white wine and picon and beer and enjoying the leisurely day. That's what you're supposed to do in France. It's, like, it's vacation. Sometimes we go from one croissant to the next. That's the whole day, just looking for the best croissant. <laughs> and that's the day, right? One place to the next and you see the things. Instead of getting on the bus, get off the bus, take a photo. Okay, this was that. Okay, get back on the bus. Uh, that's not, you'll see stuff and you'll see things you won't even, you didn't even know you wanted to see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that's the beauty. I mean, Oregon is beautiful, but there's something really special about walking through a city and seeing Roman ruins. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. So, <laughs> nature. Nature, exactly. Super nature. The wilderness. <laughs> So how what when you when you're when you're planning a trip in the when I'm a value and planning a trip to France, what are the what are the biggest differences? What are the biggest uh, kind of what do you have to plan for in each place that's that's different than the other? So for here for sure right now they're just day trips uh, in the Lamont Valley. In France they're eight days long, so it's a completely different ball game. They're eight days. I, you know, I'm I'm dealing with their accommodations, transportation, uh, lunches and dinners, breakfast every day. Um, you know, you run up against, I mean, they're, they're not, we're not together every second. So in France, the rule is if we have lunch together, we don't have dinner together. If we have dinner together, we didn't have lunch together. Um, and breakfast is typically a, a long stretch of time. So you can, for the early risers and the, the last minuteers. <laughs> and there's not very many early mornings, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then here, it's more, you know, it's, I try to have a rule of three for wineries here. Um, my sort of take on it is the first one is the most educational, sit down, sort of talking through things. The second is where we have lunch, so that kind of vibe and really good wines that pair with different foods. And then the last place is what I call the sip and view. Mm -hmm. So we're going to just sip and view and relax and enjoy the day. In France, it's a lot of leisure time. They don't even know they're getting education in the middle of it all because it's so sneaky in there. But I even, I schedule nap times in France. I schedule snacks. Like, that's, you gotta really mm -hmm. 
watch those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Blood sugar levels and nap times mm -hmm. is what I believe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> with education specifically, what would you hope someone who went to a France with you on a trip, what would you hope they would come away with? I think sort of the same thing that I learned when I was living there, which is that wine is accessible to all. You don't have to be a master psalm to know about wine. Uh, I was just with winemakers last night asking very, well, I thought they were very basic questions. <laughs> and this is stuff that they just, but I'm not a winemaker, right? So why would I know those things? I don't have to know those things to enjoy wine. Mm -hmm. and I think sometimes people discount the wanting to learn because they're afraid of how big and vast it is. So they just don't do it at mm -hmm. all. And then they just buy whatever's the least expensive or has a pretty label, which we've all done. <laughs> it's very important. <laughs> Price point labels, mm -hmm. I mean, it's mm -hmm. true. So I want people to see that they, especially when they meet the winemakers, when we were in France, we went to Nicole Chanrion, who's in Bruy in Beaujolais. And when we walked up, she was still tying vines. And she knew we were coming. It's not like she didn't know. <laughs> but she put my team to work. <laughs> and they were so excited to tie vines. Like, they're like, look at us. We're working in a French vineyard. And she's like, free labor. <laughs> yes. She's like, we're going to do these rows. It'll be amazing. And they're like, yeah, we'll do it, you know? Except for she had to keep, like, fixing their ties. <laughs> so it was maybe a little more work for her. But then they took more pride in, like, when they came in to drink the wine because they had had a little more understanding of something that went into the process of making it. Um, and so one woman had come on my trip who was just there strictly for the history and the food. She's not really a big drinker. She drank that wine that day. <laughs> she did. Sure. I was like, yes, I'm getting her drunk. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but I was like, yes, she's drinking wine. I was really excited. <laughs> What it, what it was uh, on, your, on your first trip and subsequent trips, what is it that appeals to you about France and, and specifically Beaujolais and Lyon? What, what, what are those places, what, what's special about them to you? So Lyon is you know, similar in size to Portland and Beaujolais reminds me of the Lamette Valley with a lot of forest and you know, rolling hills and the, the sort of humbleness of it and just the way people are very inviting and warm and welcoming. The food is incredible in Lyon, uh, the culture, the history. Uh, it's very walkable, and it's the same. It's literally like 30, 45 minutes to Beaujolais from Lyon, just like Portland to Lamb Valley. So those are a lot of those sort of geographical similarities that I love. But then culturally, the people are being warm and welcoming, and then both having good food and good wine. But Lyon was really just, um, I had an option of three places. It was Paris, Lyon, or some tiny village and Paris was too big and the village was too small and Lyon was just right. So <laughs> it just sort of happened. It wasn't really, it was almost throwing a dart on him. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm going to Lyon. And then it just turned out that all those things happened to be there. And so it just became this perfect little melting pot and how serious they take their food and their winemaking. I mean, you really can go around looking for the best croissant all day and have a very different experiences with the croissant. <laughs> so uh, uh, tell us a bit about your uh, your passion for, for Gamay, the, for the Gamay grape, and uh, mm -hmm. specifically what the, what the history resonates with you. Oh, my little underdog <laughs> grape. <laughs> Trying so hard. Uh, yeah, I loved the story of Gamay, and really when I started drinking Beaujolais at Le Pigeon, of course, they were the premier, the crew, you know, the crews. So they weren't the Beaujolais Village or Beaujolais Nouveau. Um, and they had such sort of similarities to the very expensive Burgundies, but a little more approachable, more fruit, higher acid. And I thought, how's nobody buying these? Why aren't, why isn't the list more Beaujolais than Burgundy? Because Burgundy is so expensive, delicious, but so expensive. And so my budget was what really started me leaning into the Beaujolais. But then um, getting to go to Beaujolais and tasting all the different, really different varieties of the crews and winemakers and how they produce their wine really started me like being like, whoa, how is this not more of a thing and why is it so inexpensive? Um, and yeah, it's the little grape that could, you know, being cast out of Burgundy in 1395 by Philip the Bold. It's a story right there, you know, and then you have to wonder why do people still care if, why if they don't, if 
this has really literally been cast out. Why would they continue to fight for it? And it's because it's so good. <laughs> it's so good. It's just delicious. Why not? And now with Oregon, same thing. People are really starting to see. And it's funny because Kermit Lynch said in 1988, as soon as people start liking natural wine again, they'll like Gamay because it has that higher acidity and the little effervescence from that carbonic maceration. And that's exactly what has happened. And especially with the budget, people's budgets. They see that there's still the craftsmanship in Gamay, not just Beaujolais, but Gamay specifically. Mm -hmm. And that's a tricky one because France definitely still has not been putting Gamay on their labels, which makes it difficult. Um, but whenever I help out at Brick House, pouring wine on their open house days, they always put me on the Gamay station. Um, and <laughs> I ask people, are you familiar with Gamay? And they say, no. And I say, have you ever had Beaujolais? And they say, yes. And I'm like, well, let's talk about <laughs> it. So you have had Gamay and you liked it. <laughs> So getting people to just even understand the varietal in place, you know, that's the huge, huge moment there. But it's just so good. It's good. I love Gamay. And as you said, it's definitely gaining steam in Oregon along with natural wine, as you mentioned. What do, what do you see from Oregon Gamay's recently so far? And what do you see for the grape here as you look ahead? It's a much more resilient grape, you know. Pinot Noir is a little finicky, and with climate change, who knows how it's going to continue. Gamay seems to thrive in, you know, harder, harsher situations, which I guess is a little like me as well. And <laughs> um, I am the Gamay grape. Um, and so I think in Oregon, you're definitely seeing more people planting it and trying and being more experimenting with it. And I think it's only the beginning of that because Oregon as a whole is still very young, you know? I mean, there's so many parts of the southern region that we haven't even explored. Something tells me there's a spot in Elkton, you heard it here first, Elkton, that I think is gonna be good for Gamay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm quite, like there's so many places that it still can be we can try it out mm -hmm. and we need to round it out a little bit more. We've got a lot of Pinot, a lot of Chardonnay, and it would be nice to see other varietals and I think that's what's going to happen. We're just going to continue to see the growth of that with more wineries, more winemakers, more people moving here and trying new things. Mm -hmm. And of course, why wouldn't you plant a very resilient grape to, to really try? And it's delicious. You mentioned it was delicious. That's, I'm, I'm glad you bring that up again because I agree. <laughs> it is delicious. Thank you for thank you for bringing it up again. Uh, so obviously, uh, a lot has happened for you in 2020. It's been a quite a busy year so far. Uh, I'm curious. I'm curious. Starting starting out about uh, experience with the first Assemblage Symposium this January. Uh, your role in it and kind of your takeaways from it. Yeah, I mean, what a fun event to be a part of. Um, I can't believe that was just this year. That's what I was thinking as I was asking the question. And I feel like it was last year. Like 10 years ago. Oh, so two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I came in kind of at the tail end late uh, and, and jumped into the steering committee with um, uh, this incredible team of people who uh, I couldn't believe all the stuff they had put together in such a short period of time and uh, the lineup of women they were able to, to get and then to be a part of that lineup and to speak um, some very vulnerable truths mm -hmm. um, on a stage with 300 of my peers and colleagues and friends uh, was beyond, I mean, what can I say? I'm, I'm on a panel with Elaine Brown and Julia Coney, like telling people about racist stuff in Oregon. <laughs> That's very crazy. It's very empowering. <laughs> um, it was probably one of the most impactful, powerful experiences of, well, of 2020 for me. There was a, and there's been a few, so it was, it was definitely on the top list. Um, and I thought it was such a well done event. Everything was just really thoughtful. Um, and what an incredible thing to bring those kinds of people together in a place to gather and have conversations. I was really, really humbled and taken aback by um, the impact of even just one person coming up to me after my imposter syndrome speech and having people be emotional with me and, and tell me that 
they didn't know that there was even a name for imposter syndrome mm -hmm. and that they didn't know that that was a thing that other people experienced because I did ask that question at the beginning of my talk after dancing on the stage which was not planned um, but I could feel the energy and I was like we need to dance it out right now because it's a little it's a lot going on in here mm -hmm. um, and I'm glad I did but I asked does anyone had these feelings of imposter syndrome and to see 300 people raise their hand and say yes that's a lot it's a lot it's a lot you know it's very powerful to to then say me too and talk about it on a stage with them and then to bring up uh, three amazing women to sort of talk through it and talk it out and for people to get something from that mm -hmm. and leave feeling um, heard and seen and lighter and brighter and stronger like wow wow I get to do that mm -hmm. that's so cool it's pretty cool all because I like to drink wine <laughs> any event where there's wine who knew <laughs> what was so uh, what were the kind of the what were the biggest takeaways you had from it what what what, what did you were you surprised to learn from from awesome Blush? uh that i could do that that i could speak those truths on a stage um in front of my peers and colleagues uh that there were other people who had felt felt similar ways to me um whether it was about being a woman working in wine um, or working in restaurants, whether it was being black and working in wine or a person of color, um, to feel that community was really huge. And the friends and people that I've, you know, connected with because of it is more than you could ask for. Like now I have this incredible support of my community even a, in a bigger sense. Um, I also took away that we can do more events like this and there's a need for them. Um, and that's a really good thing because we won't make any progress if we don't start having conversations. Um, that's where we need to find that community and do those kinds of things. Um, I also took away that some of the things that maybe I've tolerated aren't okay and I don't have to tolerate them and um, sometimes it means having to get loud um, sometimes it means having to look at yourself a little longer but either way and however you do it there's some things that you just you don't actually have to tolerate there is another way for things to be done um, and also I, f I found it really fascinating that people weren't totally aware of some of the um, the racial issues in Oregon, which I found very surprising. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I thought, where have you been? I'm not making it up. <laughs> this is real stuff. Oh, you didn't know? I did. Okay, well, let me, let me fill you in. <laughs> let me fill you in on a little thing called racism <laughs> that's still alive and well. <laughs> yeah, but I'm happy I told it because people took something away from it. I didn't know I had to tell people that I grew up here. So yes, I like mushrooms too. <laughs> <laughs> you have to make special food for me. Like, I, I mean, I, I like things that are culturally black, but I'm also a Pacific Northwesterner. Salmon. I grew up with a grandfather who was a fisher and a hunter. Like fisherman and a hunter like that's all I grew up on was fish deer elk duck pheasant just just like everybody else <laughs> like living out in the countryside in the northwest I remember when I first had to start buying my own salmon I was like this is this is expensive <laughs> and not nearly as good <laughs> and not nearly as good this is crazy <laughs> been paying this much money for this grandpa just brings it <laughs> Deer? Ooh, who knew venison was yeah. fancy? I just, <laughs> you know. You mentioned your surprise at having to inform people of, of racism in Oregon and of racism in, in the industries you've worked in. Has how has racism, I guess, we'll say, improved a, 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 during your work in Oregon? And how has diversity in, 
I want to say racism improved. How has racism ch changed in the industry? How has mm -hmm. diversity improved in the industry since you've been a part of it? And especially in the first half of this year, what have you seen change? Uh, it's changing. I think there's a combination of the world changing and me changing. I'm getting a little older and a little wiser and um, working for myself has definitely given me a little more freedom that I maybe didn't have before because I was fearful of losing my job or um, having to negate that my voice against someone else's agenda. Um, so now s those things have sort of changed so then I'm changing. Having the support of other people of color in my life, um, in my industry, gives me the, the strength, I guess, to speak out or to say something. Um, so in those ways it's changed. In the climate of the world or in my little bubble of Oregon, I definitely see more articles being written, more conversations in social media, um, more businesses taking action, um, but we have a long way to go and Oregon is just, it is what it is. It's not a very diverse state. Um, there's reasons for that, legal reasons for that. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> There's historical facts that are reasons that that's a, that's a true thing. And so it's not like this veil was lifted and all these black people moved here. It's, that's not happened. Um, and so that's just a truth. And so until those kinds of things change, we'll just sort of be working with what we have, right? Mm -hmm. Making things better. Will it continue to change? Of course, it has to. Change is inevitable. Uh, will it change for the better? Hopefully. Change for the worse? Who knows? Um, but all we can keep doing is sort of keep trying and having these conversations and talking things out and um, hopefully creating spaces to diversify the spaces that haven't had diversity in them. Mm -hmm. And I think that the hardest part people are having with that is understanding that you can't just say you want to add diversity. You have to actually change the system to create the, the door to let the diversity in. <laughs> How does that happen? And what is like the next step? If you, if you were in control of, of, the, of the, say the restaurant and wine industries, what's the door that needs to be created? How does that happen? So in restaurants, I would say that, um, in, in restaurants and in, in maybe even in schools, I went, when I went to school, it was a vocation. So, you know, you had opportunities to get into fields during high school. Uh, and then with restaurants, training from within and actually having real training guides and real opportunities to take the time to train people up and you know to give them a hand up um, whether that's and I've had that I've been really lucky to have people pay for wine classes I've had people sit with me and mentor me and do those kinds of things so that I could have that education but we have to actually give it to people that's why they're not in those spaces when it comes to wine, my hard truth right now is there's no more, there's no longer a harvest intern. It's just not a thing. Sorry, it's just not. It's done. Free labor's gone, and that's okay. It's gonna be all right. <laughs> We're gonna make it. The margin's gonna change, but we'll figure it out. But you can't ask for people to come into these spaces especially when it comes to internships like that. There's a reason black people or people of color haven't been in those spaces. I personally can't afford to go do an internship for a temporary job with no housing, mm -hmm. no stipend. That's, that's why that doesn't happen. People want to say that, well, it's this nomadic life and that's just how it's always been and that's what it is. Okay, well, you tell me your grandma didn't send you $500 every month or your uncle didn't send you $200. A lot of people of color don't necessarily have generational wealth that's going to allow them to eat and drink <laughs> and house themselves while they're doing some internship of free labor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and if they can't, if people can't see that, like I get it, that's how it's worked and that's how it's been, but it's not working. So maybe we have to change it. I'm not saying change the entire wine world. I'm saying change this one part of it in order to allow for diversity. And I'm seeing people do it. There's wineries who are offering incredible opportunities for people to come and do all these things. Now, it's possible, so I don't want to hear that it's not. <laughs> are there, you mentioned not changing the whole thing and having the one focus, are there other stumbling blocks, other roadblocks on the path towards having a more inclusive industry? Yeah, of course. I mean, again, We didn't get here because the system, just just the system is not working, right? We're in the system. We're cogs in the system, right? So we're also a part of the, this problem. I'm guilty of it too, knowing where I shop, knowing who's part of my bank, knowing who's a part of what things I buy, how I purchase, um, who I vote for. There's a lot of parts to this, but to just sort of be like, well, this is the system, and now you're like, it's like a merry-go-round that's going around really fast, and you're trying to throw things into it, and it's like, that's not gonna work. You're gonna have to slow it down and reevaluate, you know, how it's working. And so, if people don't wanna start taking a look at the system itself, and then internally looking at themselves as to what maybe some of the problems were, we'll never make anything different. You're just gonna keep kind of putting a band-aid on it or trying to temporary fix it and that's just that's not sustainable which is exactly like going back to having someone come work a temporary job how are they supposed to sustain themselves after that what's the what's the end goal of that because I know a lot of people who are willing to come to Oregon from the United States from within they would love to come here and work but they just they financially can't it's just not viable for them so when I'm looking at these wineries with a lot of money and reach and this capability, I don't, I don't see why helping five people isn't worth it to them. Five people who, if they did this and they could come back, or that they did this and they weren't stressed while they were doing it, could make a change for the better. Maybe they would move out here. Maybe they would, isn't that what we want? We want people to come here and work and continue to build our, our infrastructure to, to bring in more money, right? Tourism is huge here. Exporting this wine is huge here. Why wouldn't we want to do things that make that better? I just ask questions. I don't really know. I don't, I don't have answers. I got questions. <laughs> it's the first, the first part of the battle. <laughs> I, the questions I ask, I don't really ask them in like, that there's a right or wrong answer. They're just questions I think we should be asking ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's all. Absolutely. So you're, you've had other, many other things this year. I know you, you went to New Orleans uh, for, for a conference. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about that, about some of the other opportunities you've had recently to kind of expand. Yeah, I mean, my community really showed up for me this, this year. <laughs> this year. <laughs> Still this year. Still only halfway through it. Ah, uh, BC, before COVID. Um, um, yeah, my community really showed up and helped me get, because assemblage happened, and right when assemblage finished, uh, Resistance Served came up, which is by Radical Exchange in New Orleans, which is a hospitality conference for uh, black wine professionals or black professionals and so I met a lot of really interesting and different people and I've never been in a room of that many hospitality professionals of color ever in my 39 years ever so that was huge in of itself and just being able to connect with them um, but then the topics we talked about were also once again very heavy topics um, feeling seen, feeling heard, uh, knowing that I'm not alone, some of these things that I've experienced or felt 
um, being a black woman working in wine. And so I definitely came away with a lot of great friends and new sort of sense of self and place. And um, that's where my father's side of the family is from. So that was a real treat to be there for that. Um, and just, again, being in a space where you're not alone, where you feel like you've got other people like you and um, that look like you and that ex have experiences like you and, and how you can all work together to sort of keep creating this change. And every single one of those people in that room are people who are doing that in the industry right now, whether it was food or farming or, you know, restaurants or farming or wine or spirits or beer, or sugar. <laughs> there was a lot of incredible people there. Um, and it was great to see not just people of color, there were white people there too, and the experience they had and hearing our stories and seeing things from a different perspective, I think was massive for them. A lot of the, the people from Assemblage wanted to come and I was like really encouraging them to come again next year. I, maybe that will happen, who knows, or at least in a couple of years, um, because it's a really important thing for everyone to be a part of those kinds of conversations. Because um, they're, they're, again, this is how we create change, right? You hear other people's perspectives and ideas and share things. It was really good. And the food. <laughs> Beignets? I mean, you know, I didn't have any beignets, which is really, I know. But I went to Cafe Du Monde and I got annoyed. So I was like, you know what? No, I'm not doing it. <laughs> I just couldn't. I was, forget it. <laughs> I don't have time for this. Ugh. It's fine. But I had like, you know, coffee chatouffe and things like that. It was good. Mm. And the jazz every night. Mm. Well, of course. I mean, live music. What a fun city. And the hospitality. The hospitality in New Orleans is special. I felt really at home. I mean, this really good service makes a whole difference. Mm. It's not just the service, it's like that they care. Like they genuinely want you to have everything you need or you don't be taken care of. Mm -hmm. Not to say that that doesn't happen anywhere else, but it's, there's a uniqueness to it in, in New Orleans that I, I'll have to go back again to really put my finger on it. <laughs> but it was special, that's for sure. And more recently, I know you, you started a new Juneteenth celebration here in Oregon. Tell us about how that, kind of how that got started. Yeah, so from uh, that, uh, from Resistance Served in New Orleans, I met three women. Um, and one of them, um, Roxy Navarez, she um, just asked us to get on a Zoom call one night uh, and drink M.A. Well, I said we should drink M.A. But, <laughs> and so it was me and Roxy and Alicia Summers and um, Lindsay Williams. And uh, we just got on this Zoom call and we just were talking and I don't, I don't even really know how it got started, but we just started thinking about Juneteenth and how we really wanted to celebrate it and do something special. And again, you know, lots of writing and drinking. <laughs> and it just sort of came and every time we were pinging things off each other and something would work, we'd pause and be like, is this really, is this working? This is working. Okay, we're doing this. And we were so, so lucky to have it just really come together in a matter of two weeks. Uh, we knew we wanted to do an educational part. We knew that we wanted to do, obviously, um, you know, it's talking about Juneteenth and of itself, and then also celebrating, because it's Juneteenth. And we wanted to, to be really focused on wine, so that's why we came up with the idea of sabering and creating that as like a, a new firework, if you will, and uh, celebration and christening of the, the day. Even though we don't, I, we don't advise you to do that with your really good wines, you know, like something middle of the road. Um, <laughs> and uh, we were really lucky to have Dr. Kaday, Dr. Akila Kaday, came on and talked about talked about Juneteenth. But she also brought a little self care into it and talked about um, recentering joy, which was really great for us. And what I, one of the things that I took away from her talk was instead of sort of thinking about that life balance, thinking about harmony in life and I thought that's such a better way to think about it as opposed to like trying to teeter-totter that thing to make it level more like flowy and I was like okay I think I can do harmony better <laughs> than balance 
And then we had the incomparable Julia Coney come on and talk about um, champagne. And then her talk turned into an after hours party and we stayed on for an extra hour. And uh, what people shared and the, the way the conversation went, I mean, it's not for recording, it was private and it was very special. And I'm, I'm so grateful that we were able to create that. And then we had a dance party with some local DJs and his daughters, his two young daughters who DJed in each event, had over a hundred people watching at every single time. And I just thought, wow, I can't believe we pulled that together in two weeks <laughs> and that people like wanted to come. And the response was so positive and what people took away from it. And we we're so excited. We were so excited to do um, more events. We actually are creating a nonprofit right now and we hope to take this to the physical space next year. Um, come on everybody, wear your mask. Um, <laughs> so we have a summer. <laughs> next summer, okay? Next summer. <laughs> if you guys cancel next summer, I'll be real mad. <laughs> um, and we want to bring those elements. So, you know, you know cultivation, uh, you know, bringing people together, you know, creating a place where people can, can learn and then obviously celebrate. And so we plan on doing more events throughout the year um, and we, we're working to get this nonprofit and create more opportunities uh, under one bigger umbrella because we didn't, you know, we had dreams but we didn't know it would actually happen. And, the people who reached out to sponsor us next year. We're gonna, we want to make this a free event for people. We want to keep it free um, as much as possible. And I guess people want it, so let's do it. Why not? Ooh, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. <laughs> it's really fun. Mm -hmm. And sabering, teaching people to saber. I did a little mini event at the Nightwood just to do some savoring and have some photos taken and called like, the five black people I know in Oregon in the industry. And they came and, you know, it was like, they were learning how to savor. It was really fun, like joyous and just, you know, it was really fun. So clearly uh, 2020 has also raised your profile a little bit. Tell me a little bit about that and, ab and about how, <laughs> how it's happened and, and sort of how you've responded to it. <sighs> I mean, I think it, it's, it's really been this um, perfect storm, right? So assemblage, resistance served, and then I went to the Culinary Institute of America's uh, SOM Summit in Napa, which was amazing, right? Um, being in the room with like master SOMs, I'm like, I guess I'll tell you this one story because it's really funny. It's funny to me. <clears throat> so second day breakfast, um, it was a toast bar. <laughs> and I had a piece of toast and I put some like cream cheese on it. And we're sitting at this table. And I'm sitting with like Corvin founder and the master songs. And they're, we're all talking. But I had started to mash some raspberries onto my toast and the table stopped talking. I was just looking down at my toes and people talking and I looked up and everyone's looking at me and they're like, you're putting fresh fruit on your toast? And I was like, well, yeah. And they're like, that was brilliant. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I was like, y'all don't live around berries, I guess. You're not Oregonians. So I was like, yeah, we put berries on, you just smash them up, it's jelly, hello. They all got up and <laughs> made toast with <laughs> fresh berries on it. And they're like, this is so good. And I was like, Come to Oregon, you I'll get you some real good berries. Ah, oh, that was a funny, funny moment. <laughs> ah, but I like, felt good that I gave a teachable moment to these very, you know, prominent people. Now they all put fresh fruit in their toes. The trend is spread. Trend is spreading, <laughs> literally. Uh, <laughs> I just thought, how did you not think that as you walked through the toast bar? You know, like, makes sense to me. Anyways, it was tiny moments. But all of that happened. And so obviously I was meeting the right people. And then, I don't know. I mean, I feel like obviously my social media profile kind of went up. I started doing my tea talks, which 
the tea talks still are just I just speak from my heart and I don't plan anything and I don't do it when it doesn't feel right and I honestly didn't think I was saying anything profound or prolific or anything I, I still don't know what made me the the first tea talk that I that I did truly came out of uh, post George Floyd and the sort of upheaval, the original up upheaval of people calling me and asking me how I'm doing. And while I appreciate the sentiment, you don't really need to ask. I'm obviously feeling pretty awful. And so I, some, for some reason, I just took to doing a live and I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm why I sat down and pressed the button, but I did. <laughs> and then I got mad, and then I got sad, and I just kept doing my lives when I was in those moments. And again, the response from people back to me of thank you, and you're saying things I needed to hear, hearing from women of color saying thank you, you're saying things that I've wanted to say, I, that's a privilege I am grateful to have. So I guess I'll keep doing it. <laughs> I guess I'll keep doing it. Yeah. It was it, when I when I spoke to you last <gasps> while we were setting this up. You mentioned now people knowing you who you don't know and being kind of a, a, a semi Ooh. a public figure in some ways. So tell me about the adjustment to that, having people look, looking to you as a public figure. I mean, social media is weird, right? It's weird, right? It's weird. Okay. <laughs> I'm looking to the young people like, it's weird, right? I'm not crazy? TikTok? I don't know. I, I don't get it. No. <laughs> I'm wait, old lady. Wait too old for that, yeah. I, uh, I mean, we were talking about this last night about like how, you know, if you missed the show, you know what? We had to wait till the show came on again. We didn't get to just pick the show. <laughs> yeah. Ah, the good old days. VHS tapes and the VCR. Yeah, I mean, I've, I, uh, I feel like I have a profile that's um, public in some ways, right? So working at Le Pigeon for three years, I did a lot. I was a, you know, I was a, I was a very good server. I did a really good job. And people remember me from that. That's already weird, right? People walking up to me and saying, you were my server at Le Pigeon 10 years ago and I had this one dish and you, and I'm like, okay, like, thank you. I mean, and I do remember a lot of people, but, and some people, um, it's turned into incredible relationships because of that. Turnot is a prime example of that. Um, Jarrett, who's the owner and uh, one of the main people, he he remembers this one time I waited on him at Le Pigeon. I mean, um, Greg and Gabby from Ox, they came to Le Pigeon before they had moved to Portland, and they were like, "We're thinking about opening a restaurant." And I was like, "Sorry, we're full." <laughs> I told them they couldn't come and open a restaurant. <laughs> and then... And they defied you? They defied me. And then years later, I ended up being the person who was uh, working as a GM at Smallwares, and I hosted their employee party, and they called me out in front of all their employees. They said, so just so you all know, Siobhan said we couldn't move here <laughs> and open a restaurant. And look at us now, I was like, okay, I was wrong. I'm sorry, God, ugh. But that's how I met a lot of winemakers and people, so that was always sort of weird. Then you're on social media, and then you start a business, and they're trying to get people to follow you because of your business, and you're posting photos of food and wine and, you know, these kinds of things, right? But then I sit down on my living room floor, and I have a cup of tea, and it goes from 1,000 followers to 3,000 followers in a matter of weeks. It's, it's strange. Um, people writing about me, or people knowing the storyline of why I moved to France, you know, that Catherine Cole wrote uh, in 750 Daily. That's a pretty intimate piece of my story and my history. I don't mind that it's out there because people feel inspired by that. And I like to be inspired, so if I can be that, that's great. It's definitely strange that people now have seen me in my robe. <laughs> <laughs> and my head wrap which is not a normal thing that Siobhan does outside of the world, you know what I mean? So that's weird, but apparently it's effective. So, and there's again, there's not a correlation. I just, 
push a little button and I just start yakking my mouth. There was no, I'm gonna do this in my robe. It was literally like, I'm mad. And so I've, I've gotta do this right now while the spirit has hit me and I've gotta like just say what's on my mind. Mm -hmm. Who knew? But the people who are reaching out, both um, winemakers and people in the industry who are asking for help to make these changes, they're seeing it now for the first time, which is both amazing, but also you're like, how have you not been seeing this? Hmm. That's weird. So finding that balance, because I, I did think that people knew and that this was just how it was, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I've just been navigating the space that's been given and now having to realize that I have to like sometimes make my own space or, you know, stand up for, for myself in certain ways. Speaking of that, how do you want to use your platform now that you have a bit of a platform and a bit of a community <clears throat> looking to you? What do you do next with it? That's a great question. Um, I don't know if I'm being honest. I feel like everything I've talked about is stuff that just is, has to do with me, right? So I'm just speaking from me. If other people feel that way or learn something from it, that's great. But there's no agenda. Like I'm just asking questions that I want answers to or that I think about. And I'm trying to get movement in a way where there's more inclus inclusiveness and uh, more opportunities for people. I was not just lucky. I worked really, really hard to get all the places and things I've done. Did I have to work harder than some? Probably, right? Is that fair? Probably not. So if there's anything that I want to do with this platform, it's sort of, again, sort of raising up the underdogs, whether it's the grape or the people. <laughs> That's my new tagline, huh? No. <laughs> finding all the gamays out here. I'm finding, I'm bringing my gamays peoples together. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, you know, we're obviously still in the middle of a pandemic, so it's still hard for me. Um, and with racial injustice and social injustice, and you know, it's, it's a tricky thing because I don't know enough about certain things to really want to talk about them. You know, on one of my last tea talks. I was trying to, I want to understand more about farming. How, what's the disconnect between the people and the food? And Mimi Castile wants to, was, was, wants to talk with me. She's so cool. One day I'll stop being a nerd about how cool she is, but no, no. no probably not. But the fact that like she's open to having conversations and educating me, which means that I could do the same for others because I do just genuinely want to understand this system that I don't understand. I don't understand how farmers could be broke. I don't understand how we can't pay people more, especially like in the sense of a restaurant, charging people what it costs to make something, right? Whether that's the farm it came from, the you know ranch the meat came from or whatever, and then the people who are making it, of giving them a living wage. How do we bridge that? How do we make that better? Um, because that creates that sustainable life, that sustainability throughout everybody. I don't know, I have big, big dreams like that. So anything I can do with whatever, if anybody, I mean, the fact that people care and want to listen to what I have to say. <laughs> it's a big responsibility though. Yeah, it is. But I, again, I'm never saying anything that's not true for me. I, I'm, not, I'm just speaking from me. I don't speak for anybody else. I don't, um, I never want to be like the person who's like specifically calling anyone out about anything. Like that's not what this is about. If people hear themselves in any of my talks, that's maybe you need to take a look and see what's going on with you. And people have, they go, man, you said it this in a way that made me think about it. And I'm like, okay. And that's great. And I'm, again, I'm not, it's not, it's, I can't do that to you. I maybe did it for you, mm -hmm. but I'm not doing it to you. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Mm -hmm. Like, there's a tiny little difference, but mm -hmm. I'll do it. 
I'll do it. I'll do it. I mean, these detox are free, you know? It's not like I'm getting paid to do them. No one's pushing me to do them. I just see that in order to affect the change, I have to maybe start asking some questions, some hard questions. Mm -hmm. And having grown up here and being an Argonian, <clears throat> mostly an Argonian, <laughs> maybe have a little East Coast European in me. Mm -hmm. I kind of understand our little um, bubble, you know, where people are mostly nice and mostly, you know, nothing really terrible like happens here on the regular. Um, and it's so beautiful and we have all this bounty of the valley and um, you, know, you drive to the coast one day, you can drive to the mountains one day. I mean, it's such a little pocket. So of course, if you don't have to like see outside of that pocket, why would you? It's scary over there, right? Like, no, I'll just be right here. But what does that do? It keeps pretty narrow, so. So what do you see for yourself as you look ahead? You're, you, you mentioned you're turning 40 soon. Happy birthday. Thank you. Um, what, do you what do you hope your 40s bring for, for yourself and for your, for your various businesses? Yeah, I, I think, uh, what do I hope for Dirty Radish? Travel and consulting company. Hmm. Um, more opportunities for travel. <laughs> Come on. And, you know, I like consulting. I really like helping people rebrand or build from the, the ground up. I like seeing the holes and like filling things in. I like um, talking about service flow and I like, I like teaching about wine. I like exploring new wine. I, I love all those aspects. So I want to do what feels good. And I also love putting trips together for people. Um, and I love taking them on trips. Because <laughs> in France, I don't drive. I have a driver <laughs> so that I can drink with my guest. <laughs> so I want to do more of that. Uh, and I just see an opportunity to expand um, my reach. I see an opportunity to expand um, my my just ability to to be able to uplift other people and and be a part of anything that's going to do that. You know, if it's being a part of a conference or do you know anything like that, where I can just Again, I'm just speaking my truth, and if apparently that helps people, then being vulnerable is my thing, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> but I want to have just more freedom, just like everybody else, more freedom of my time and what I do with it, um, leaning into what feels good. You know, we all have things like we don't like doing, but are necessary for running a business. I'm learning about delegating. <laughs> <laughs> it's a thing I'm learning. Like, I don't like accounting. <laughs> Hire an accountant. Mm -hmm. My God. It's crazy. <laughs> it's an amazing ability to have, too. Like, oh, I, can, I can just give this to someone else and then I'll do it. I well, don't have to. I think people don't sort of realize, too, that that frees up your time to actually do more things that you like to do, which then in turn brings you more business, right? So. Uh, my nephew used to play this game. I think I think it was literally called Capitalist. <laughs> I think that's what it's called, something like that. But the game is that you have to, uh, your lemonade stand has to become successful. And then once your lemonade stand is successful, you can have a manager. And when you have a manager, the manager just keeps making money for you. And then you can go build other things. <laughs> and he was always playing this game, going, I need more managers. I need more managers. <laughs> So that he could then buy, you know, pizza shops and dry cleaners and, you know, like, like trying to build this city. <laughs> I was like, you know, I really like if it would say, I need more support. As opposed to managers to run my things. Like, I need more support so that I can <laughs> continue to build up. Oh, I forgot what that game was called. <laughs> Maybe like clicking, you know. Yeah. <sighs> This manager dusted up this thing. I'm like, what game is this? <laughs> it's 
sounds like something like the Soviets would have created in the I 80s. No, I don't like, know. It's an evil it, American it, game. It's so stupid. But that's again like training, you know? Like how do we train people? Um, how do we train within companies? Like how are we making our employees sustainable parts of our, of our community, of our company? Um, I don't think you should ever hire anyone for an entry level position without a path for them. Right? You think someone's going to be in an entry level position for 20 years? No. So why would you why would you start that? That's just that's just turning the people over, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So why not build them up? And you know someone else is going to come in, another young person's going to come in, and they're going to want to come in even more if they know that there's an opportunity for growth. Mm -hmm. I think that should just be a part of every company. If I ever had employees, that would 100% be a part of the Dirty Radish model. I don't know if I'll ever have employees, but. What about as you look ahead for Oregon and the wine industry here? What do you see in the next five, 10 years? What do you see happening? And, and maybe what are your hopes for what, what could happen? How much more time do you have that on the camera? Just, uh, plenty. <sighs> All right, here we go. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, okay. This is this interview is gonna have the most like laughing breaks I think I know. we've ever Sorry. had in an interview. <laughs> I'm fine. Okay. Wham Valley. There's so much potential here. I'm so incredibly like grateful and proud and humbled by the people who've come into this community and created this agriculture and these wineries. The I can't look at a plot of land and go, you know what I'm going to do here and like think that long term, right? So how cool is that, that that happened and it's still happening, that people have this pioneer spirit to come in and do these sort of things. What I'd love to see is everyone working together cohesively with a common goal of making this a welcoming place, both um, with our hospitality and our roads and, you know, um, tourist opportunities, whether it's hotels or restaurants, um, to bring people here to show them the place where these amazing wines come from and foods and, and things like that. Um, I think it's going to take all of us working together. I'd love to see more of that. Um, I know it happens, but I think it can happen even better and even broader, you know? There's a lot of companies and things and people and boards and I think everyone should just sort of come together. Mm. And I'd love to see that be a huge part of what we do here in the business and, you know, tour guides and bringing people from all over the world. And that's what Dirty Radish hopes to do is expand to bringing French tour groups here. We're like number three on the list for French tours. Like we fight between Utah, between three and four. <laughs> of destinations. I know, right? New York is one, then San Francisco. And then it's like they either want to come to Oregon or Utah usually. Desert, there's no desert really in uh, France. Okay, got it. So like Zion and, sure. you know, that kind of thing. So there's opportunity here and I just want to see us do the best that we can with it. What do you hope the industry looks like in 10 years? Like me? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> uh, the sustainability of it, you know, both in the agriculture and its and its workers. Um, I'd love to see, obviously, more diversity, more women, um, more women in ownership positions and management positions. Um, I definitely would love to see more diversity, and it's possible. It's definitely possible. There's a lot of people who would love to come. To Oregon and work and learn. Yeah. One last question for you. And you talked a little bit about this in your very first answer, but I'm just curious to give you a chance to expand a little bit, a little philosophical for you. What is what is wine's purpose in society? Mm, in society. <clears> hmm. <throat> <sighs> What I love about wine is that it's this combination of science, art, and nature. Nature slash luck, right? 
I mean, I've been in vineyards and I've seen hail and it skipped over one winery, <laughs> one vineyard, right? So nature slash luck. <laughs> um, and so that's sort of how we have in life, right? It's a combination of art, science, nature, and luck. And I don't know if you know, but life is, can be kind of tough sometimes, it can be kind of rough. And it's nice to have a little relaxant sometimes. <laughs> so I think its purpose is to bring a little joy and relaxant to people's lives through art, science, nature, and a little luck. Excellent. That's all the questions that I have for you. Is there anything cool. I didn't ask that I should have asked? Anything we didn't cover today that we should have covered? Do you have any questions? Late? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Did we cover everything? You good? Thanks. Cool. Thank you so much Thank for you. coming in today and, and spending some time and sharing your story with us. And, yeah. Uh, no, it's nice that we, it's nice to have seen the seen your your rise lately. And, oh, and thanks. Can't wait to see what you do next. So. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Let you off the hook.